In today's video, we have a lot to cover, including the latest trade talk for the offices and focusing on teams like the Edmonton Oilers, the Carolina Hurricanes, and the New Jersey Devils' pursuit for a starting goaltender. We also have some free agent rumors around the Toronto Maple Leafs. If they have to choose between Bertuzzi or Domi, and they both can't stay, how does that end up working out? Habs defenseman Caden Gooley has been suspended. We have several other updates around injuries, roster updates, and some more signings as well. Plus, some East Coast Hockey League teams are in serious trouble and maybe folding all that and more coming up next So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a lot to cover in today's video. Uh, let's kick things off with several updates from the Department of NHL Player Safety. Uh, let's get started first with Montreal Canadian defenseman Caden Gooley. Uh, Gooley has uh, conducted a hearing and has been suspended for one game by player safety for slashing that took place against Flyers forward Travis Konechny uh, in yesterday's game. Now, uh, the slash on Konechny is not just the fact it was a slashing call, but it happened while Gooley was on the bench. So obviously, when you're on the bench, you're not supposed to interact with any of the uh, you know players on the ice. Uh, if you leave the bench, for example, after a whistle when there's a skirmish going, you can get in some pretty serious hot water. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that it wasn't more, just given the fact that he was on the bench. If it was strictly because the slash itself, I think one game for a young player with no history is probably okay. I just thought where he was on the bench, they might be a little harsher on it, but they decided not to be. Uh, so again, like I said before, player safety can be really difficult to predict to how they're going to react. But I do think a suspension here is definitely warranted because of the nature of it. Um, but again, one game is all they've handed out. Ducks forward Ryan Strom has been fined. He's fined $5,000 for cross-checking, which is a maximum allowable in the uh, CBA uh, for a situation that happened against the Seattle Kraken the other night. And Philadelphia Flyers forward Garnet Hathaway, who's certainly known as one of the tougher guys around the NHL, has been fined $2,000 for embellishment or diving, which is... Not something you want to get a reputation for, obviously. Now, if a player is fined for embellishment, that means that they've previously received a warning. They get warnings from the NHL before they're ever fined. Apparently, he received a warning on January the 2nd against the Edmonton Oilers. And then the next incident happened the other night, March 23rd, against the Boston Bruins. So Hathaway has been fined $2,000 for embellishment. If it happens again, uh, then the fine continues to go up each time. I think it goes up by like two grand in, in each incident, I believe, to a maximum, I think, of 10000 if I'm not mistaken. So uh, certainly not something that you want to have that reputation for by any means. Uh, now, of course, as I mentioned, lots of other updates around the NHL, including some roster moves. And the Philadelphia Flyers today did make the news that we talked about yesterday regarding goaltender Ivan Fedotov official. He's officially with the Philadelphia Flyers. He was at practice today. We had heard that he was en route to Philly. Clearly, when Daniel Briere spoke to the media yesterday, he was asked about this and uh, kind of played it off that he needed more information. Wasn't ready to talk about it, but obviously everything was well in the works. Um, the NHL has confirmed Fedotov is able to join them and play immediately, and he's also eligible for the playoffs since he's technically been under contract for the entire season. Of course, just coming over now after having his contract terminated in the KHL after the uh, the Russian League essentially signed him and basically forced him to stay even though he signed a contract with the Flyers almost two years ago. So we'll see the six foot eight goaltender uh, has certainly had a lot of success everywhere else he's played. We'll see how things go in the NHL. Of course, he's never played at this level. Uh, it's a subsequent move. Felix Sandstrom has been demoted to the American Hockey League. Now the Red Wings today confirmed They've recalled Zach Aston Reese on an emergency basis, so he should be able to join the team as uh, the, the, most teams get back to action tomorrow on Saturday. Uh, the Seattle Kraken have also recalled defenseman Kale Fleury on an emergency basis while also confirming that Gustav olfsen has been reassigned. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks today confirmed they've activated Dakota Joshua from IR, so that's great news. He's playing a pretty important role for them. And the Penguins today also recalled defenseman Ryan Shea and announced that John Gruden, as a subsequent move, has been reassigned back to their AHL 
Affiliate, a couple of big milestones in the NHL this week. Corey Perry appeared in game number 1,300 with the Edmonton Oilers the other night, so that's certainly a major accomplishment. Perry's been in the league a long time. Um, He very well could hit other milestones beyond that, considering we don't know how much longer he'll continue to play, but he's still producing and uh, certainly being an active um, member of the Oilers that's and you know obviously can can still play it. So hard to say how long that will go, but uh, 1300 is his current milestone. And Washington Capitals defenseman John Carlson is uh, expected to play game number 1000 tomorrow night against the Boston Bruins. They do have a ceremony planned for him to celebrate the accomplishment back in Washington uh, later in about a week or so's time once they um, get back and are at home. Um, I think it's April 7th that they plan to do that. So good on John Carlson. He's had a heck of a career. Nice to see him hit that major milestone. A couple of signings today as well. The Seattle Kraken today confirmed they've signed prospect uh, Lucas Dragasevich. Uh, he's a second round pick from the 2023 NHL draft. He gets a three year entry level contract, 950000 AAV. Uh, the Nashville Predators today also signed prospect Ryan Ufko. Uh, he also gets a three year ELC. He was a fourth round pick back in 2021. Recently wrapped up his college season with the UMass Amherst team, who uh, lost a heartbreaking game to the U of Denver after uh, it went to overtime after. Um, UMass Amherst, I believe, uh, uh, you know, kind of pushed that one further than they were expected to. Uh, had a great season. He was co-captain there as well. So he's going to be now getting his pro career underway with the Nashville Predators. And the Toronto Maple Leafs today confirmed they've extended defenseman Simon Benoit on a three-year contract. Average annual value of $1.35 million. I think that's a great deal for the Leafs. He can certainly be a solid third-pair defenseman. He seems like he's been a good fit in Toronto since coming over um, during free agency from the Anaheim Ducks last year. Uh, Benoit was not qualified by the Ducks becoming an unrestricted free agent. And I got an offer from Toronto, and it's worked out rather well. Uh, So like I said, for them to have a third pair D extended for three years, um, that's certainly great news. Like I said, he's been a great fit and should be somebody that they can uh, rely on here uh, over the next number of years. He's certainly not afraid to play the you know, rougher, tougher style of game, not afraid to drop the gloves. So I I think he was a great find for the Leafs and uh, good for them to get him extended and to uh, stick things out on a longer-term basis. Now, as I mentioned, one of the other bigger news stories that's not really getting a lot of attention, but to me is pretty important for a lot of these prospects' futures. There's a couple of teams in the East Coast Hockey League, the ECHL, which are in trouble, and we don't know the future of those teams. They may end up folding, and they both impact the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens, uh, the Hams affiliate and Trois Rivières, uh, and the Toronto Maple Leafs affiliate in Newfoundland and Newfoundland Growlers, uh, they're both actually owned by the same company. And the company that owns these teams are actually in the process of going bankrupt. Uh, they were told by the league they had to sell these teams by April 2nd. That is very unlikely to take place given the short time span. Or the league appears like they're going to be taking them over. There's a big meeting on April 2nd to determine if these teams are even going to be permitted to play out the rest of their season um like many leagues in hockey they're you know approaching the um the the end of the regular season here they're not too far away from it so obviously that would be terrible news for these teams and their prospects to to no longer have a place to play and for their seasons to come to an abrupt end uh, i would think that there's a good chance hopefully that the league can take these teams over and at least get them through the season and then determine in the off season here what to do next obviously the maple leafs and uh, habs organizations do not own these teams directly they are just affiliated with them as a place for their uh, prospects to go of course the east coast league is a level below the american hockey league so they're essentially you know two tiers down from the uh, nhl Uh, i mean you do see players make the jump that worked their way from east coast league to the ahl to the nhl not as common uh, usually for prospects if they have to start in the east coast league and spend any significant amount of time there oftentimes they don't make it but some do there are some great examples of that tanner janelle being one of them and there's others as well so certainly
certainly uh, be curious to see how the East Coast League handles these situations with these clubs here, with the, uh, like I said, that ownership group going uh, into bankruptcy by the looks of things. So I know Newfoundland, for example, that uh, team is extremely popular over there. We just saw Terry Ryan come back out of retirement uh, for one game because they were short players uh, and had a big... uh, uh, you know, appearance there back a couple months ago. So um, I know the Newfoundland team has a lot of passionate fans. Uh, they'd be incredibly sad if the team um, is no more. I know that for sure. Um, so hopefully they can get things sorted out and uh, get new ownership there for uh, for the future to keep these franchises. If the East Coast League loses a couple of teams, that's not going to be good for um, the pro hockey teams and their prospects in general. So We'll see where all of that goes. Now, as I mentioned on the uh, rumor mill front, lots of things to talk about here today. Uh, one, let's start with the Carolina Hurricanes. Uh, there's uh, some expectations around the NHL that the Hurricanes are most likely going to try to move the former uh, third overall pick in the 2018 draft, Jesperi Kakaniemi. Uh, he's very much likely going to be a trade target this offseason. The Hurricanes are very much expected to be a cup contender. We'll see how the playoffs go, barring some kind of significant increase in production from him then i suspect um, you know it's not going to be easy to do but they're definitely going to try the the hurricanes need cap flexibility as bad as anybody um of course they have guys like uh, natchez and jarvis are going to be looking for new deals uh getting extensions and of course between brady shea and brett pesci uh, you know, they obviously want to be able to retain at least one of those defensemen, and it's going to be tricky and challenging to do all of that. Um, so certainly getting some extra cap space would be great. Uh, he makes $4.8 million, but the problem is he's signed for another six years, and his production hasn't really been where it needs to be. I don't know if a team like San Jose or Anaheim or one of the Western teams that are rebuilding, if they'd be interested in this kind of player who can, they can give a bigger role to. Um but yeah, six years left at four point eight million, not looking so good. I think the Carolina Hurricanes—they've got to have regrets over that offer sheet. I know from a just from a fan standpoint, and from somebody who reports on the league from an entertainment standpoint, that the offer sheet was huge. It was nice to see teams being bold for a change and getting outside the norm. But you know, I I do wonder if they have regrets right now. I mean, obviously the player hasn't really worked out. Um, and now they're stuck with a long-term contract. He does have a form of a no-trade clause too, but it doesn't kick in for another season, so they still have time to try to move off that if they can. I'm not sure how that would go, if they'd have to eat some money or what have you, but they're going to be looking for cap flexibility to try to retain as many of those other guys and make them satisfied with their new contract. So Kakaniemi could be a victim of the numbers game here, but certainly, like I said, he's overpaid, so it's going to be very, very challenging uh, to do. Uh, Lots of speculation about the Oilers and the future of Evander Kane. Like I mentioned before, he seemed to be quite annoyed that he was scratched uh, against the Senators there last week. Um, Certainly, it looks like he and... Some of his teammates and management may not be on the same page, and it just seems like things might be kind of wearing a little thin with Evander Kane in Edmonton. As I mentioned before, it it just seems to be that kind of effect that he seems to have on his teammates over a period of time. He's been there a couple of years now. For the most part, things have worked out. Uh, He hasn't been a problem like we heard um, some of the stuff that was, you know, affecting things in San Jose before he ended up in Edmonton. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's really difficult to say where things stand. I mean, yes, he's probably frustrated. He's been uh, certainly not getting the results he wanted. I believe he's at 18, I think it's 18 games without a goal. Uh, he's certainly making over $5 million. He's expected to score, expected to play a lot with top players, and he's just not getting the job done right now. So this playoff um, season coming up, I think it's going to be huge for him. I do wonder, though, if he's not you know, playing well, if he could be a scratch come playoffs. Maybe not all the time. I don't know that he's going to be a regular, though. I do wonder how that's going to affect things. And his performance in the playoffs, I think, will have a major impact over his future. But I would not be shocked if the Oilers talk to Kane in the offseason about a potential move. He does have a no trade, though. And that could very much complicate things for sure. Um, yeah, we'll see. But Evander Kane and Edmonton seem to be having their issues and patients are kind of wearing thin with his struggles. And I guess they can tell with his teammates like Drysaddle, just the way they've interacted with him on the bench and whatnot. So we'll have to monitor 
that situation as well. Uh, in New Jersey, there's a, um, an article in The Athletic where uh, Pierre Lebron interviewed GM Tom Fitzgerald, asking a lot about the future plans and whatnot of the team. He did ask uh, Fitzgerald if teams like the Calgary Flames should expect to hear from him yet again to continue working on the goaltending situation in the offseason. And he certainly did not deny it. And he said, you know, that they wouldn't be the only ones to hear from him. So, like I said before, the fact that they traded Venichak, they brought in uh, Jake Allen, they got Kakinen, uh, they can send Dawes down to the minors and let him, um, you know, along with Schmeed, kind of just work on development, think more about the future. Um, I don't know that Kakinen will be back next year. That's probably less likely. Jake's played pretty well for them, kind of taking over that starting role for right now. I don't know that they want to go into next year, though, with him as the main goalie and a guy like Kakinen or Dawes backing up. I honestly think they would prefer to have a bigger name starting goaltender and kind of trying to develop more of a 1A, 1B scenario. As I mentioned before, I think Jake's best body of work and best performances seem to come from when he's in a tandem situation. And I think sometimes when he's overworked and there's too much pressure on him, seems to be when his play suffers. Uh, like I said, when, when he had Carey Price, when Price was still healthy in Montreal, or before that, even when he was in St. Louis, uh, before he lost his starting job to Bennington prior to that, when he had like Brian Elliott and some other star, um, you know, solid backups working with him, where he was more of a 1A, 1B platoon kind of guy, that's when he played his best. Uh, so for, for Fitzgerald to continue to search for guys like Jacob Markstrom, Linus Allmark, um, you know, maybe uh, some other goalies out there, John Gibson's a name to kind of watch. I do think based on these comments and based on the makeup of this team, uh, I have no doubt that the Devils are going to continue to try to bring in another star goaltender to work with Jake, that he'll be more of a 1B or a backup for next year and that can really take the pressure off the kids and run with some more experienced goaltending here obviously some guys like alexander holtz uh, maybe some of the other prospects might have to be players that are sacrificed to bring um you know a steady experienced netminder in but that's like seems like what's needed here to get this team to the next level travis green certainly a serious contender to take over as head coach on a permanent basis We'll have to see, though. Not a given. It sounds like Fitzgerald may want to explore some other candidates before making a finalized decision. Now, in Toronto, if you're Maple Leafs GM Brad True Living, you may only be able to keep one of Max Domi and Tyler Bertuzzi. It's not a given that they're both going to be back. They both signed one-year deals. Uh, the Leafs do have, of course, like a lot of teams, a lot of money tied up on their cap. They are going to have a little bit of uh, wiggle room now with the increase coming for next year. But at the same time, they have a big contract extension kicking in for William Nylander. They have to address their goaltending. Uh, they don't have um, all positions, you know, there's still a lot of like empty spots of players that they need to either bring back or replace. And that's going to be challenging. The, the possibility of keeping Domi and Bertuzzi both are probably pretty slim. I would think that by the way they've played this year, I know they both had not the greatest starts, but they've production wise been okay now. Uh, I would think next time around they're going to want more term, which is going to involve more money. And I just don't see a scenario where they can bring both guys back. Now, I know, you know, because of his father's past there, there's probably some, you know, a little bit of a sentimental attachment to Max Domi, hoping that can work out long term. But what is Max Domi? Is he a winger? Is he a centerman? Is he a third line? Is he a top six? He's been all over the place. It's hard to say where he fits best. I'm not sure. Another big question around making that decision likely is going to be whether or not Sheldon Keefe is the head coach next year. We don't know where things are going to go on that front, depending on how the playoffs go for the Leafs. Obviously, if they have you know, winning uh, at least a round or two, then I would suspect there's a decent chance Sheldon's back. Um, if they happen to go out first round, wouldn't be shocked if they made a change. Uh, if they make a change, I think a lot of that's going to maybe depend on some input from that coach as well as the current management group. Obviously, Bertuzzi, more of a goal scorer, uh, whereas Domi is a little bit more of a setup guy. He's going to give you less goals, but more assists. A little bit of versatility because he can play on the wing. He can play center. I think he's a better winger myself, but nice to know that he can be a center fill-in if you're kind of stuck or you have a you know unexpected injury, something along those lines. I'm not really sure who I would pick because they are kind of different players. But I kind of think it depends on where 
you think each fit and it kind of depends as well on what else you have and where you think you need the help the most uh, i think you could probably make an argument for each player but like i said unless one of them or both of them take a significantly under market contract which i don't know they're going to want to do yet again i think they're probably both looking at things like they gave up some uh, some term for an opportunity to join the leafs and with the hopes of extending uh, if they're not able to get both guys worked out and you can only keep one, who's it going to be? Which guy do you keep and why? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments down below. And of course, that's all for today's video. So let me know your thoughts on all of today's news and rumors down in the comments. We'll discuss further. Of course, if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time. 